Hi, my name is Thais Gibson, and I'm the owner and co-creator of the Personal Development School. This is your daily breakthrough video, and in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fearful avoidant attachment style and their relationship to sex. So the reason I'm doing this series is because I have had so many questions on this topic. I get emails, tons and tons of emails every day about different attachment styles and their relationship to sex. And I figured instead of answering them all individually, I would just put out this information. So um, if you haven't already checked outside, checked inside of the personal development school, please do so. I answer a ton of questions in there live as well. We have two live webinars each week um, for members. And I also have a ton of information on all attachment styles, transforming your attachment style, healing your relationship to your emotions, and we will have so many courses to come. Um, and also because of so many questions I've had, I've decided to run a course about attachment style um, different attachment styles and their relationship to sex and how to repattern any limiting patterns or painful experiences that we're having, whether it's in the relationship or as the individual with a limited and painful attachment style that might be causing challenges. So um, as I go into this video, I want to ask that you make sure you keep an open mind, um, that you don't take all of this information and just start judging or sort of seeing anybody straight through this lens. Um, that you might know who is fearful avoidant because this is one attachment style where the patterns are probably the most incongruent. So everything I'm, I'm about to share is something I do see often. I would say it's a pattern that probably occurs in about 80% of the people I've seen in my practice. And I'm going to bring a research study, a case study into this um, just to sort of back up some of this because I think this is very, there can be many layers to this. Let's just say that. So I'm going to just go into what I tend to see with fearful avoidance. And I want you to keep in mind that this is not um, congruent 100% of the time. I would say out of all attachment styles, fearful avoidance are probably the most unpredictable in terms of their relationship to sex because they have both that anxious and avoidance side. But again, there are still some major patterns I see about 80% of the time. And a study sort of corroborated this as I was doing some extra research to make sure um, that everything was sort of in alignment with what I've seen in my practice. So also keep in mind that this is not the healed fearful avoidant. This is somebody who still has fearful avoidant attachment style. The truth of the matter is that as we do change our attachment style from insecure to a secure attachment style, it does impact our relationship to sex. I haven't seen an exception to this rule yet, um, but it's because we make sex about what it actually is as opposed to maybe a lot of the fears, a lot of the limitations, a lot of the shoulds around sex, you know, those, those different patterns that are associated with different attachment styles start to sort of peel away and sex sort of falls into its natural rhythm in a relationship as a result. So um, as I go through this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about a study I found in the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy that basically sums up what I largely see in my practice. Um, so number one, fearful avoidance tend to have the highest number of sexual partners. It's a general rule, general rule. I do see sometimes polarities on the other side of this, okay? Um, and they also tend to be the most sexually compliant. And what that essentially means is that whether it's with a partner or outside of a partnership, they tend to engage in sex when they're not necessarily in the mood or when they don't necessarily feel like it's the right thing. So why is this? Well, in my opinion, part of this comes from many different reasons that are very much related to the fearful avoidant attachment style as a whole. So number one, very poor boundaries. Almost all fearful avoidance, whether it's physical invasion, whether it's mental or emotional invasion, or whether it's actually some kind of sexual invasion of boundaries in childhood, they all tend to have a caregiver or multiple caregiver figures or any other sort of attachment figure that can be in the home, whether it's like a close um, nanny, a close relative, something like that, um, they do tend to have a pattern of having their boundaries invaded in childhood. And basically, they learn to adapt to this and sort of surrender, essentially. And this can be, again, this can be like physical violence. This can be just mental, emotional invasion. Um, parents who are very, like, you know, extreme helicopter parents, extremely controlling um, this can be because of some kind of sexual trauma that occurs in childhood. It can, be, it can be for many different reasons across the boards. But what the fearful one learns in terms of attachment is that their boundaries don't really matter. And in fact, expressing their boundaries often gets them punished or makes, makes them 
receive the messaging that they are unworthy of love, if love is withheld or withdrawn. So this obviously has an impact on sex because sex is a very um, intimate act, but it involves very much knowing your boundaries and understanding where you're at. And if that's not a conditioned part of a healthy attachment style, um, and if that's not something that's you know, there and aware, then obviously that's going to impact the fearful avoidance relationship to sex as a whole. Now, um, there are a few other potential factors that can Im impact this, right? And this being, just to re review, because I know I'm giving you a lot of information, um, this being the fact that fearful avoidance tend to have um, the most number of sexual partners and be the most sexually compliant. So this can also be because there's a deep need for connection for fearful avoidance. There's a deep need for the fearful avoidance to often feel loved. And like they matter and that they're worthy of love and yet they have a really avoidant side. So sometimes what I see in my practice historically is that if there's a fearful one who's unwilling to be vulnerable, right? They don't want to be emotionally vulnerable because they don't feel necessarily safe or like they can trust sometimes. And again, sometimes this is not always the case for all individuals. Sometimes the fearful avoidant will feel like sex sidesteps the emotional vulnerability and it's a way of producing deep connection because it is a very intimate act. And there is a certain amount of vulnerability in a physical way, but there's sort of this protection around the emotional vulnerability and the, the mental vulnerability for the fearful avoidant. Now, if there's sexual trauma, this is mostly just to be really clear. This I see mostly when there isn't sexual trauma in the fearful avoidance childhood, but there's a lot of invasion trauma around um, emotional boundaries, mental boundaries, and even just physical boundaries like a parent, um, you know, maybe yelling at you and then being like, okay, give me a hug. You know, it's fine. And the child not really wanting to give the parent a hug yet and feeling like it's invasive and yet feeling like they can't set a boundary and say no. Um, or physical violence, like, you know, hitting or sometimes even just spanking um, if this is something that was really upsetting to the fearful avoidant in childhood, right? So, so this I tend to see happen the most when there isn't sexual trauma. When there's sexual trauma, this tends to take a very different direction. And that's why I ask, you know, when I, as I go through this video and maybe you're thinking about somebody in your mind that you know, that you're in a relationship with, maybe you're thinking about a parent and understanding your parent better or a sibling or a loved one or just a friend, don't make assumptions that all of these patterns apply. Because again, this is very unique. The relationship to sex tends to be quite unique for different fearful avoidance. We see patterns for sure that do show up very congruently and over the vast majority of the time. But we also see strong exceptions to these patterns as well. Um, so that can be one factor. And in the case of sexual trauma, it tends to go very much one way or the other. Um, it, we tend to see polarities as a result of sexual trauma as, again, a general rule. Um, but what we will often see is that a, an individual suffering from sexual trauma in childhood or at any point in life either becomes hypervigilant about avoiding sex and very closed off or becomes... Um, very hypersexual and again feels like they can't say no and and this largely has a bit of a relationship to what type of sexual trauma occurred what the sexual trauma was like but I'm not going to get into that in this video because that's a very different topic of conversation for a very different time um, another thing about fearful avoidance that we see is that um, sex can also be linked to pleasure seeking and if there's a lot of trauma we know that the brain has a homeostatic impulse. The brain wants to equilibrate. So you'll notice, all of you, no matter what your attachment style in your daily life, if you tend to experience um, like a lot of pain, if you're in a period of life where you're more depressed, you're more anxious, you're unhappy in your career, so 40 hours of your waking life plus um, is, is not feeling fulfilled, wherever there tends to be more pain, we tend to start becoming more pleasure-seeking. So as an analogy for this, Maybe you'll see somebody who really doesn't like their job that's like, yes, five o'clock happy hour. Can't wait to leave work and drink wine or beer or a cocktail. And, you know, when somebody's pleasure seeking, it's often because they're in subtle pain. Or we might see sometimes um, maybe like an individual who really doesn't like their job and, you know, is always eating junk food at work, right? Their brain's in subtle pain, so they're seeking subtle pleasure. And again, this can occur in a variety of different forms, but for the fearful avoidant in terms of sex, sometimes. Um, we can use sex to escape depression, anxiety, things like that that they might be experiencing, right? And that can be a way of sort of pleasure-seeking or distracting from their inner pain, okay? Now, another thing that we'll often see as well is that fearful avoidance can sometimes be dissociated from themselves 
but hypervigilant about the feelings and needs of others. And sometimes they're even more identified and feel safer in the feelings and needs of others because they don't really want to get in touch with their own feelings and needs because there's a lot of pain or trauma there bubbling beneath the surface or just because being hypervigilant and connecting to others made them feel safe in childhood and it was an adaptation they made in order to sort of adapt and cope in their environment. So how does this impact sex? Well, obviously there's going to be a small correlation there because if you take an individual who's much more in touch with their partners or other people's feelings and needs that they might enter into sexual relations with, then what's going to happen? They're not checking in to see, hey, how do I feel about having sex? Am I ready to have sex? What are my boundaries right now around sex? Am I feeling connected enough to my partner emotionally to feel comfortable and safe during sex and open to sex? If none of those things are there, obviously this creates a different type of relationship to sex and it's going to influence it one way or the other. Um, another reason I sometimes see that fearful ones can have more sexual partners is because they also have this need for closeness, and yet they also have a, vol a, a tendency towards volatility in a relationship, which can lead to more breakups, and therefore, um, because that need for closeness comes back, sometimes they'll jump from one relationship to another. This is not always the case. Again, sometimes I'll see fearful avoidance out of relationships for long periods of time. There's usually a correlation here in 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 regards to what stage of the fearful avoidance life they're in, whether it's you know their adolescence, their early adulthood, later adulthood, etc. Um, but what this can produce, right, is a need for closeness, more unstable relationships or unstable relationships, instability in relationships, and um, as a result, sometimes more relationships, which obviously means more sexual partners, or obviously means it's likely to create more sexual partners. So. Um, what else can I tell you here about fearful avoidance? Um, sometimes as well, they will think that sometimes there's this like association for a lot of individuals who are fearful avoidant that they always have to earn their worth. Um, that tends to be one of the most pervasive patterns I see in fearful avoidant attachment style is that they feel like they always have to earn their worth and earn love. And so for some individuals who haven't connected to that stable sense of self yet and haven't really, um, let's say like started healing or started working on themselves, sometimes there's this underlying message where it's like, oh, what does the media tell men and women all the time in a variety of different forms? Well, if you look good and you're seductive, you know, you're getting attention and love and if fearful avoidance really need a lot of that love and want to feel seen and connected to, sometimes that's a subconscious strategy to get those needs met. And so sometimes fearful avoidance can be a little bit more seductive or a little bit more like appearance oriented as a strategy for sed seduction and attention and connection um, over time. It's just a general rule that I sometimes tend to see. Now, keep in mind, not all fearful avoidance present like this, okay? There's still a solid number of individuals who do not fit this mold exactly. And sometimes I even see fearful, fearful avoidance who just avoid sex altogether or can be really disconnected from sex as a whole. And this is usually because of whatever limiting beliefs they have about sex in general. This can also just be for like spiritual religious reasons, right? That, that an individual can still have this attachment style, but be choosing to live um, a lifestyle where they um, don't want to have sex before marriage um, or for any number of reasons, right? So keep in mind, this is a general, general rule. Um, but I hope that answers a lot of your questions about fearful avoidant attachment style and their relationship to sex. And stay tuned because I will talk a little bit more about the anxious attachment style and their relationship to sex next. Um, and then I'll go through a little bit about secure relationships and what the sexual relationship should look like, not should look like, often look like for a secure partner. And um, keep in mind, I will be running a course for this and how to overcome these limitations inside the personal development school in the future. So I hope to see you in there. Thank you so much for watching. And also, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to these videos. Thank you.